The railway between Melbourne and Adelaide snakes through the Adelaide Hills on its way to the capital city of South Australia, through tunnels and cuttings in the undulating landscape. When it was built in the early 1880s, it ran a slightly different course. There were once two viaducts that carried the locomotives and their carriages high over a valley in Wattiparinga Reserve, and three more tunnels, since converted to open cuttings. Only one man lost his life in the construction of this length of railroad, a former Portland jail warder named Robert Puller. On the 6th of August 1881, a loaded truck got out of control on wet rails and sped down them towards where a gang of men were laying rails. A worker named Cole tried to slow it down by hanging onto the back of it as he yelled for the others to get out of the way. All but Puller heard the alert. The truck slammed into the man's abdomen, pinning him against the bank of the tunnel. He was removed from the scene, but died 20 minutes later of internal injuries. The few reports of the incident are vague on details of where it happened, other than saying it was near the 14-mile camp, which places it near the present Belair Railway Station, and the closest tunnel was the Pinera Tunnel. If so, it was a remarkably unlucky tunnel. On the 17th of September 1925, around 4pm, two old sleepers, several discarded arms from telegraph poles, rocks and dirt were piled on the lines just outside the tunnel. The driver of the passenger train to Bridgewater saw the obstacle in time to apply the brakes, as the train was going uphill at this point. A train coming downhill towards Adelaide would not have had time to stop due to its momentum. Police investigated the apparent attempt to derail a train, and put it down to schoolboys, and it appears no one was ever arrested in connection with the incident. In 1928, the tunnel was being replaced by a cutting with a road bridge over it. The original railway was a single line. As far back as 1914, plans were announced to have double tracks, but World War I intervened, and duplication was only carried out as far as Eden Hills. In 1926, with the population of Belair and Blackwood increasing, the work was planned to recommence. By the end of 1927, the demolition of the old Panera Tunnel had begun. It was too narrow to allow for two lines side by side, and the cutting was widened to allow for the trains to take the bend on a wider curve. Among the men working on the project in January 1928 were Paul Pat a 35-year-old Macedonian man who had been working for the railways for four months. His real name was Tavlos Petrov Saldaris. He had a wife, two daughters and a son living in Macedonia. John Wittenbury, 50, son of a pioneer settler of the same name, who recalled scything wheat where the suburbs of Dulwich and Rose Park now stand. Ambrose Guido Clarence Gledhill, a Victorian aged 36, was a returned soldier having been awarded the Military Medal in 1917 and a bar to it in 1919. He had one child. William Kilmartin, aged 28, who had been married for 18 months and was the father of an eight-month-old daughter, was also a veteran of the Great War. Robert Roy Lafferty was single. He drove a cart for his brother's timber business until he started work on the railway five months earlier. Gary Costello, 55, had worked for the railways for two years and was unmarried, as was an Englishman named Charles R. Smith, who was 47. Smith had worked all over Australia on railways and irrigation projects. He had worked for the South Australian Railways for about a year. Arthur Newcomb was 26. He had been married for four years, and was the father of a four-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. And Charles Wilkinson was 52, married with three daughters. Tuesday, January 31st, 1928 had been an unremarkable day at work. Rain had fallen heavily in the morning, and though it rained all afternoon it was only light, but storm clouds were dark in the sky, and the men were probably looking forward to finishing work at 4.45pm and going home. The ganger in charge of the 17 men working at the site, Henry Mountford, was at the top of the tunnel when he glanced at his watch. It was 4.32pm. Then he looked over and noticed the earth on the bank of the cutting was beginning to slip. He managed to call out under below before he jumped aside, bruising himself in the process. The loose earth became a landslip, estimated to be between 200 and 400 tons of soil. 
In seconds it had crashed down on the exposed brickwork of the tunnel and collapsed part of it onto the men working there. Lionel Griffiths, an electrical fitter who had been speaking with Mountford near the end of the tunnel only minutes before, said the reverberation of the earth sounded like the crash of artillery. He quickly ran and telephoned Belair and Blackwood stations to advise them of what had happened and to stop the trains. Mountford immediately checked who was missing. Nine men were unaccounted for. Their workmates began digging into the clay in a frantic rescue effort. Joined by others, up to 150 rescuers cleared the debris away from the tunnel mouth. As the night dragged on, several men who were told to rest refused and kept digging. One man, one of the foreign-born labourers working there, simply relocated to another spot and kept working. Locals who heard of the disaster came to help as best they could. Among many who assisted, Archie Jones, a butcher of Blackwood, was the first to bring a supply of food. James Holstead and his son provided the first coffee. Arthur Gooch travelled along the line with tea and coffee brewed by his sisters, and Mrs Galt also provided food. The blacksmith's shop was converted into a temporary canteen, where hot drinks, sandwiches and cakes were provided by the railways department. Dr Browning from Blackwood arrived to give medical aid. Lighted drums of coke gave a means for the men to warm and dry themselves after being soaked by the rain. A work crew from the Adelaide Electric Supply Company was rushed to the site to install a huge floodlight to illuminate the rescue work. Wittenbury was a carpenter and had just come out of the excavation on the west side when the ground gave way without warning. He found himself falling with it, pushed head first through a hole made in the bricks of the tunnel by the weight of the earth. His scalp was badly lacerated, his right eye was black as ink and closed, and his jaw stiff, but otherwise he escaped injury. Ambrose Gledhill was working at the end of the trench and saw the earth falling down and tried to dive into a V-shaped corner he had been cutting. He was still buried up to his waist, however. He was first to be freed. Some Maltese workmen dug him out. Beneath him was Arthur Newcomb. It is thought that with Gledhill extracted, Newcomb was able to get enough air to survive. A true survivor, Gledhill emerged from the catastrophe with bruising and was able to go home to West Mitcham. He had also escaped an explosion unscathed previously at work and had recovered from being shot nine times during the war. He was awarded the military medal and his position was outflanked by German soldiers. Asked by his officer to go for reinforcements and ammunition, he made his way through two lines of the enemy to achieve the objective, on the way shooting four Germans and capturing two. Robert Lafferty had only turned 21 the previous May. He lived at home with his parents at Clarendon, a nearby Hills town. Rescuers could hear Lafferty and Newcomb moaning as they scrambled to unearth them. One of the rescuers was Mr V Nichols, who was on his way home to Coromandel Valley when he heard of the incident. He was a personal friend of Robert Lafferty. When Lafferty was reached and asked how he was, he said, I'm alright, but get it off my back. He was found to be bent forwards with his legs apart and his left leg tucked underneath. Two boulders pinned his hips and a pick was jamming his foot. His boot was cut off to release his leg. He told Dr Browning that he had no feeling in his legs. He was given a cigarette to smoke, which he did, but soon after grew faint and was administered morphia. He told his mate Nichols, Nobody knows how I lived through it. I was afraid I would go unconscious. He asked how his mate Newcomb was, and how many others had been injured. Before he was taken in the ambulance, he said he'd be alright. He only had some soreness in his back. Two hours later, Robert Lafferty died in hospital, becoming the sixth fatality of the Pinera Tunnel Collapse. Newcomb and Lafferty had been working at the other end of the tunnel most of the day. They had only been called to the end which collapsed at 3pm. Newcomb had boards placed around his head to prevent further slippage of dirt onto his face and a handkerchief soaked in whiskey and water given to him to suck on. He said he felt good but his legs were a bit stiff. All the while he felt the earth was becoming heavier and heavier as it settled and breathing became more challenging. Despite his predicament, Newcomb kept up a brave face, smiling at jokes while he remained entombed. Rain fell from the thundery clouds, 
and at times water was pouring down the face of the cutting and threatening to send more cascades of earth down. Gutters were hastily dug at the top to divert the water away. As the rain abated, after waiting seven hours, Newcomb was given an injection of morphia and finally pulled from the earth at 2.15am. His mates encouraged him to buck up as he was taken to the ambulance. He called back, I'll not forget you boys for all you've done for me. On reaching the hospital he was in good spirits and remarked, I'm home on the pig's back. Reflecting on his entombment in hospital, he said he was between Lafferty and Kilmartin when he heard the warning shout, but there was no time to do anything. The weight of the earth pinned his arms and legs and he found breathing difficult. Charles Wilkinson was the first of the dead to be recovered. Known as Deffy due to a hearing impairment, he left a widow and three daughters aged 23, 17 and 6. The rescuers toiled in the rain until 3.15am. Lightning flashes illuminated the scene of the disaster. The thunder rumbled all around and the wind howled through the cutting. In the suburbs a house was struck by lightning and streets flooded. A deluge at 2am soaked the men to the skin, but slipping in the mud and hit by small rocks continuing to roll off the bank, they persisted. Others arrived at 6am to continue the search. By this time, hopes for the safety of the remaining four men were diminishing. At 4am, Dr Browning was resigned to the fact of their deaths and departed the scene of the tragedy. Around the same time, early editions of the registered newspaper was distributed free to the workers, police and others present to verify or dispel rumours that had circulated during the long night. At 6.15am, an overhang of earth which had been nervously watched through the night suddenly gave way. A quarter of a tonne of dirt crashed down, just missing the men, endeavouring to free the body of William Kilmartin. Kilmartin and Costello were discovered between the wall of the tunnel and the face of the cutting. The pair had evidently seen the avalanche coming down on them and grabbed each other as it buried them. Kilmartin's body was laying on its side, with his head badly crushed. Costello was beneath with his left hand over his face. Costello too had been badly crushed by the fall. The bodies were exposed by dawn, but the soil was sticky and heavy and there was little room to manoeuvre, The six rescuers used picks and shovels to clear away the ground from the bodies. At 7.30am the body of William Kilmartin was removed, but it took a further three quarters of an hour before that of Gary Costello could be extricated. Costello had only returned to work that morning, after ten days annual leave. At the same time another body was found near the rail lines. A bag was laid on the ground to mark the spot. At 8.40am the Melbourne Express was given permission to come through the tunnel. Although part of the wall had been forced in by a foot, there was just enough clearance. Slowly the engine inched past the scene and made it through safely. Men rested on their shovels and picks, enjoying a rest from their exertions as it inched by. The bodies of Smith and Pat were recovered just after lunch and taken to the morgue. Smith had left his native England at the age of 12 and come to Australia. It was believed he had a sister living in England but no relatives in Australia, although he was treated as one of the family by Mr and Mrs Tully, whom he boarded with at their house in Pirrie Street in Adelaide. He had only recently recovered from a six-week bout of pleurisy and pneumonia in mid-December. Smith was due for holidays, but when asked why he didn't take them, replied, What is the good of taking holidays when I have no money? Paul Pat's brother, Chris, lived in Broken Hill, and the two had spent Christmas in Adelaide together. The rescuers were treated to a lunch of steak, chops and vegetables by the Railways Department as the effort reached its end. Timing in this incident was both cruel and fortuitous. Costello had returned to work that day. Newcomb and Lafferty had been working away from the landslide area until an hour and a half before it gave way. The men were due to knock off work just 13 minutes before the ground gave way. Fortuitous, for the Melbourne Express was due to be passing through the tunnel just 20 minutes after the landslide occurred. Kilmartin, Smith and Costello were buried at West Terra Cemetery on the 2nd of February. Wilkinson was buried at Mitcham and Rafferty at Kangarilla. Pat was buried on the 3rd of February at West Terrace. The inquest into the matter took place on the 7th of February. The cause was determined to be a plane of weakness across the strata called a crosshead, which could not have been detected until after the slide. 
There had been no cracking of the clay, and some blasting on the prior Sunday was away from the tunnel, and thought not to have affected it. The foreman had inspected the cutting daily, and had checked it only about ha half an hour before it gave way. He had no reason to suspect it was unsafe then. A finding of accidental death was made. In March, the widows of Charles Wilkinson and William Kilmartin were awarded £600 compensation each. It appears the widow of Paul Pat in Macedonia received nothing. The new bridge opened in June 1928, the final support being installed at the place where the men had died. Of the survivors, Ambrose Gledhill died in a Perth hospital at the age of 59 on the 26th of February 1951. John Whittenbury was 88 years old when he passed away in June 1966. The last survivor of the cave-in was Arthur Newcomb. After his experience he fathered one more son and was a great-grandfather when he passed away at Hove, South Australia on the 30th of October 1982 at the age of 80.